Well, can I have a massive round of applause for Mr. Ranjan Bhattacharya, my business partner? Go that way for you. Thank you, thank you. Fantastic. Right, OK, so um, we've come up with 31 strategies. Uh, but actually, there's lots of stuff you can do in property. And really, apart from the ones that take advantage of new rules, um, there's not much new. There are some new rule strategies, but there are some strategies that there's a time and a place for. Uh, so what we've done is looked at the strategies which are really optimised for the state of the market as it is now. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop th tour through 10 strategies, um, and this is what we're going to be encouraging our students to do. Uh, so let me take you through number one. Um, now, I haven't been a fan of HMOs in recent years, um, in the last couple of years in the main, but I think HMOs are coming back into play. They're coming back into play for a couple of reasons. First of all, the rents in town, major towns and cities across the UK um, have pretty much skyrocketed. <clears throat> if you're starting out in life, the step to getting a one-bedroom flat is just too much um, in terms of cost, particularly when you have to sort of pay all the bills, council tax, and all of that. And that's created a massive market for HMOs, and in particular, quality HMOs, where people are willing to pay more for a good quality accommodation. Now, I did my first HMO uh, way back in 1991, 1992. It was a completely different market back then. A lot of people, uh, I mean, the market was pretty much for shabby rooms to let. And that was because most people in their 20s and 30s were only in that sort of accommodation. Why? Because they were saving up for a deposit. These days, people are not saving up for a deposit to buy their own place. And they're willing to spend more on having quality accommodation or, uh, for now, for the here and now. That market didn't, so, didn't really exist when I got started. And what we're seeing now is that even in suburbia, you're getting London type of room rents because of a massive shortage. Um, there was a massive cloud uh, over the whole HMO strategy, which has now been sorted. Um, I was deeply concerned about HMO banding on every single room um, because it meant that you could, you could have a HMO in a town and the neighboring property could be an HMO as well and one of you could be banded and one of you isn't. That's not a level playing field. You can't compete on those sort of terms. Now we've had certainty. Uh, there is going to be no banding of individual banding on HMO rooms. It's going to be as, as a whole house. That's great. That clears that up. Um, the other thing we're seeing now is that with interest rates reducing, when you, when you do an HMO, you're typically buying something. You, you often buy it with bridging finance or short-term finance. You're adding value to it to uh, get the optimum HMO rental. And then you're looking to exit finance on a long-term HMO mortgage. Now, what we saw last year was some of those refinance rates just being too high, uh, which meant that you had to leave an awful lot of money in every HMO deal that you did. Now, of course, those rates are ticking back down. And we're going to see a continuation of that through the year, which means that exit finance on long-term loans will again come back into play. Now, a lot of people talk, a lot of people who are new to investing or have invested, who started investing in property just in the last five years? Interesting. Now, a lot of those sort of folks say to me, oh, interest rates are high. Um, the thing is, um, the last time interest rates were 6% um, was round about 2000 and, uh, 2007. Uh, when interest rates were 6% at that time, um, inflation-adjusted house prices um, are actually lower now than they were back then. If, if you account for inflation, the house prices today are lower than the last time properties were sorry, the interest rates were 6%. And the other thing that's happened is, since that time, rents have gone up by more than 30%. Um, so I think what I find is often um, newer investors are not aware of the sort of historical context of how, sort of how good and how the stars are suddenly aligning again in 2024 to make this worthwhile. 
Now, all the strategies that I'm talking about, pretty much all of them, bar one, um, involve um, uh, keeping the property for the long term. Now, one thing that is dead is vanilla by to let. Don't, I, it, it is going to be um, unviable to buy a property and just rent it out as a single let. Um, it is still possible to make the figures work in certain areas of the country, but those are such low capital value areas, you may not have any long-term capital appreciation in that, in that sort of stock. So pretty much all the stuff that I'm, I'm saying is about buying cheap, buying well, buying properties that you can add value to in some way, and then refinancing at the upper value and letting out for cash flow. Um, now, this is an interesting one. Um, these are going to be an extinct species five years from now. Freehold dwellings, freehold houses under £400,000 within the M25 and in the counties just outside the M25, they're fast becoming extinct. The stuff that builders are putting up now tend to be leasehold, freehold houses are a lot more expensive than that, and, and they tend to be leasehold properties. They're a lot smaller, uh, so what will happen is that these sort of properties will be um, are exceptionally, are increasingly becoming rarer and rarer. Of course, when you buy these sort of freehold properties, you have more space than in a, a comparative new build, um, which means you've got more options to reconfigure it to optimise the cash flow. Um, and these, of course, make good uh, rental HMOs as well. Now, um, I'm looking at quite a few of these, actually. Uh, very, very exciting. Um, there are massive changes happening uh, to leasehold, uh, under leasehold reform. Um, and this will make it easier and more certain that people with leasehold properties will be able to extend the leases um, and even buy the freehold much easier than they can do now. Um, leasehold properties under 75 years, with under 75 years left, left to run, um, can be a massive issue, uh, but they can also be a massive opportunity if you know how to unlock the value that's in them. Um, so what I find the best things to focus on are sh short lease properties, anything where the lease is under 80 years, but it's a shabby property where the layout is poor. Um, often these sort of properties uh, with shorter leases tended to have been converted a long time ago. Um, they were in the days where people had a separate lounge in a flat and didn't have a lounge-kitchen combination. You know. Um, one-bedroom flats actually had room for a bathroom rather than vertical bathing, which we call a shower. You know? So um, older flats tended to be bigger, um, and they can easily be reconfigured. Um, it, is, it is normally that there are ways of reconfiguring larger, older, one-bedroom flats into two-bedroom flats. Combine that with a lease extension strategy, and you've got something that pays you. Now, in, in this market, what you want to be doing is buying cheap and buying something that you can add value to. So the value here is through reconfiguring the flat layout and also through extending the lease. And once you've added that value, you refinance and you pull out all or most of your money and then rent it out for cash flow and go again. <laughs> most of these strategies are in that sort of vein. Um, flips is coming back into play. Um, there are more and more uh, flipping opportunities, and I think that's because, well, I know that's because of the availability of property at auction. When I look at the number of lots that were sold at auction pre-COVID, um, pre-COVID, if you look at any auction house, their catalogues now have three times as many stock as they had pre-COVID. There's a lot more stock going on at auction. And uh, I think a lot of um, uh, particularly residential owner-occupier buyers are scared of auctions and they don't know how to um, uh, get their financing in line in the necessary timescale. But we have bridging finance. Once you master the art of using bridging finance, it's simple. You've got to think of it as you get short-term money to buy the thing, you add the value, and then you either sell on or rent out and refinance and go again. Um, 
Bridging finance has always been very, very competitive. You know, when I started out in property, bridging finance rates were typically, um, they were nearly 2% a month, quite frankly. These days on residential property, you're getting under 0.8% a month. Uh, so bridging finance is very, very competitive today, and there's so many providers of that stuff. Um, if you're flipping properties for rental, um, great. Yeah, that's a classic Brewer method, and I've talked about that on YouTube. Um, if you're flipping properties to sell on, then I would focus on first-time buyer properties, properties that will appeal to people on the first rung of the housing ladder. Because when you're a first-time buyer, you've got to save up for the deposit. So first-time buyers are less likely to buy shabby property from an auction and do it up themselves, because they'll need a ton of cash which they haven't got. If they are buying a property that you have bought from auction, refurbed, and are flipping on, then the buyer of that property is pretty much getting a 90% mortgage on the new value. So they need less cash to buy a done-up property that from you than to buy a shabby property themselves and spend the money doing it up. First-time buyers um, are the, is the market to go for if you're doing sell-on flips. Um, be mindful of the six-month rule because your end buyer of the property um, may have an issue getting a mortgage because some lenders don't like it if the, previous, if the person they're buying off has owned it for less than six months. Um, so that's something that you've got to be wary of when doing this. Um, property prices pretty much flatlining um, over the next year or so, at least. Um, except times like, and there are lots of rule changes coming in, um, the rent reform bill and all of that. And these are times when people that have been in the game a long time think about cashing in their chips. They're not seeing an upward cycle, an upward capital appreciation cycle for a good few years, and they think about cashing in their chips. And um, the things to focus on are tired landlords with tired properties. Um, now, I, I find that um, um, when, I, when I actually started in property, I was in my early 20s, and I bought quite a few of these like in this way from very tired landlords. There were people that walked around with a bunch of big bunch of keys in their pocket, and uh, they seemed to be doing everything themselves, from fixing a leaking tap to showing people properties, and they just looked completely clapped out. You know, um, The way you don't become clapped out is to invest in systems and processes and have people to do the stuff so that you never become tired. So when you have that operational efficiency in managing your uh, property portfolio, you just never get tired. Um, but a lot of these guys have a lot of equity in their property, and, they're t uh, and they're, they really are poorly laid out properties. Um, we see portfolios where um, people have got HMOs, but they've only got four rooms, when with a little re bit of reconfiguration, that property could easily yield five or six rooms and perhaps some en suites here and there. So the strategy is to uh, target these exiting tired landlords with tired properties. Um, do a lease option type of deal uh, where you pay them a rent uh, for the a, a monthly rent for the property for the for portfolio uh, and you have an option to buy those properties uh, at some point in the future at a predetermined price and then if you're buying a portfolio of four of them uh, one by one you refurb them you you optimize the cash flow that you get from those properties and then you refinance them and exercise your option to buy it's a very, very efficient way of getting good quality stock from the many landlords who are of a certain age with a certain type of property stock that are calling it a day. Um, there are new rules coming in this year. There's a consultation coming in this year, and these are, are, will, will be implemented around about March time, which give a whole bunch of new PD rights. Now, I've talked about permitted development where you can convert commercial property to houses. There's a new permitted development right coming in where you can take a C1 hotel guest house type of building and convert it to residential use. Now, one of the reasons I think this is quite interesting is that if you take a commercial building like a warehouse or an office, no one sleeps in an office. I guess it depends what day job you're doing, I guess. But generally, people don't sleep overnight in those sort of buildings. This is the first PD on a commercial building type where people actually sleep overnight. 
So it's already near, it's the closest to residential type of commercial building there is, a hotel or a guest house. Um, and that's going to come in uh, under the prior approval process uh, at, at some point this year. Um, the thing I'm really excited about is the, is the um, extension of Class G permitted development right. So Class G allows you to put two flats above a shop. Uh, you will uh, now be able to put four flats above a shop uh, under permitted development, provided subject to minimum space standards, of course, 37 square meters per flat, um, uh, the, the, uh, all the habitable rooms need to have natural light and that kind of thing. Uh, but you'll be able to do four flats above a shop. Now, this property that I've showed you here, under the previous rules, you could only do two flats above this shop, um, which is a waste of a floor. Now, provided you've got the space, four flats, PD, again, it's a massive gift to the small-time property developer. Uh, I'm very excited about this one. Um, which is, There's a consultation paper uh, this month. This is likely to come in in March which is the first ever permitted development right on a residential property that allows it to be subdivided. So you'll be able to take a freehold house and convert it into two dwellings. So that can be two flats, but if it's a double-fronted house, it can be, you can make it into two semis. Um, it, you can convert a property into two dwellings. Um, <coughs> provided you don't make any exterior changes. I think the sweet spot for this particular um, type of property is going to be around the £350,000 mark. If you buy, if you find some area where, you know, a freehold house is at twenty grand, it's not, you're not going to be able to, the cost of conversion won't be worth any uplift to make two maisonettes. So when you're 350k and above for a house, it's, you're going to start to find that the economics of this um, work really well. With some of these new rules, it's about taking first mover advantage. It's about starting looking for this stock now. Uh, because when these rules come in in March, uh, there won't be that many people that will know about them, and there won't be that many people that will jump upon them in the, in, in, in the, in the immediate few months that follow. Um, uh, this is one that's very, very exciting. Um, with permitted development for commercial to residential conversion, um, these rules first came in in 2013, and you were allowed to convert a vacant or a tenanted uh, commercial building to residential use under the original rules in 2013. Then in 2021, they changed them. They said that you could only convert a commercial building if it has been vacant for the three months prior to putting in your application. That put a bit of a spanner in the works, because let's say you're buying a commercial building and the lease ends in April. If I want to buy that building today, it means I have to buy the building, I have to wait until the tenants move out in April, and then I have to wait three months um, while it's empty before I can even put in my permitted development application. And then it's 56 days from then on. So that really... Um, upsets things a little bit. Now, they are, they're, they're planning to remove that vacancy test, which will mean that you will be able to look at properties which are coming up, um, which are becoming vacant over the, uh, over, over the forthcoming months. I found those deals much easier to do, um, because if you can exchange contracts or secure the property with some kind of option, on a property that doesn't, where the tenant, commercial tenant doesn't leave until, say, July. That gives you plenty of time to prepare all your plans, get all your surveys done, get all your ducks in a row, so you can make that application as soon as the tenant uh, vacates the property. Um, and of course, number 10 is my good old favorite commercial to residential conversion. That's going to go be on steroids, I think, um, in, in, from this year onwards, with further relaxations of the existing rules that came into 2021. They're, they are doubling or removing altogether the maximum amount of space that you can convert um, under, un, un, under PD. Now, I think commercial to residential conversion um, under any class um, of PD uh, is great because of this. Commercial values are really, really suffering. 
if you speak to people with commercial mortgages and commercial lenders, I don't know whether people know, if you have a residential buy-to-let, um, you, you've got your loan for 25 years. If you've got a commercial property buy-to-let, you've got a commercial loan, and you often have a five-year loan, or seven-year at most, and they're usually um, review points where the lender can basically re, um, conduct a review of your loan facility. And what they're looking at is covenant. What they're looking at is, well, interest rates have risen because uh, the rent that you charge on a commercial property is dependent on the interest rates. It has a big correlation to the interest rates. So the higher the interest rate, you tend to find um, the lower the commercial property value. So what we're seeing now and what is happening now is that many lenders have lent on commercial property buy to let are having these um, loan reviews and reassessing the lending facilities that they've given out, which never happens on residential buy to let. And, and if they don't like it, um, if they devalue the commercial property, then um, they, can, they, they ask the, um, the investor to, to put in a cash injection or give you 90 days notice to sell. Those are your two. So there are a lot of commercial buy-to-let investors that are stuffed um, with the interest rate movement. So with falling commercial values when, and flatlining residential values, there's even, and even more PD rules that allow more types of buildings to be converted in more ways. There's even greater sort of margin to be had. Building costs have gone up, but the other sort of benefits have moved in such a way that the econom economics kind of, kind of work. Um, so 10 strategies. Um, we've actually gone through about 31 different strategies. Um, which will work over the next few years simply because of the way the different dynamics that Andrew is explaining um, uh, actually pan out. But they all, they, they, they're all um, underpinned by the same principles. Um, what you've got to do is buy well. You've got to buy cheap. A good way of, uh, one way of buying cheap is to find a motivated seller. Now, with residential property, you know, someone might have debt or... Um, have some personal circumstances that they need to sell quickly. But one of the things about residential property is that anyone who's seen a few episodes of Homes Under the Hammer knows what you can do with a three-bedroom terrace. There's not much imaginative. That you, you, we all know what you can do with a three-bedroom terrace. Um, so you're really relying on, if you're finding good residential stock, on finding a motivated seller. Um, with commercial property, it's different. Um, not everyone knows all the rules, and not everyone has the imagination of how to squeeze the most value out of a commercial building. If you've gone and seen a um, defunct bank building, you know, defunct bank buildings are, are quite scary for the, uh, the first-timer. You see all these safes and vaults and um, uh, spaces, and you, and you just wonder, how can you repurpose this? Um, so it's not easy for people to see how most commercial buildings can be repurposed um, to the, as easy as it is to see how a three-bedroom terrace can be optimized in terms of value. And that's why the values, um, uh, sorry, properties can be had at such great value. So whatever you're doing, you need to be buying well. You need to be buying stuff for motivated sellers or where other people are not seeing the angle that you're seeing or where you are taking first mover advantage because you know about a new rule that is about to be implemented which isn't common knowledge right now. And then you're looking at adding value um, because if you're waiting for capital appreciation, it'll happen. You know, a boom will happen but it ain't going to happen for the next three or four years. Um, what you need to do is add the value now by doing something which adds significant value to the property now. That allows you to refinance the property when you've done it and get back a lot or all of your capital that you've put into the deal. But when you are adding that value, you've got to be adding capital value and rental value because you need to cash flow it now through <coughs> rental profits um, to pay the bills until the capital appreciation comes. Now, 
in the UK, uh, every time we have had a period of double-digit inflation, property prices have doubled within a five-year period. In 1981, we had double-digit inflation. In 1982, it was 10-11%. Within five years, property prices doubled. Uh, in 1971, when there was inflation because of the oil crisis and all of that, property prices doubled. Uh, that was quite an extreme inflationary spike in 71. Property prices doubled in a two-year period. Whenever inflation has hit double figures, property prices double um, uh, within five years. Why? Because um, what happens is every, the price of everything increases. Um, and slowly, wage growth um, kind of takes hold. We've already seen 7 8% rate, wage rises last year and, and the year before. So as wages start to step up, then people's affordability starts to increase, their mortgage affordability increase. And there's also the psychological factor, because if everything has gone up, uh, food, electricity bills, everything has gone up, if someone says to you 100,000 pounds, it doesn't feel as much, uh, like as much money as it did two years ago. So imagine that three years down the road. So that is why, um, when we talk about, when people talk about, will there be a massive fall in prices? No. Because we've had so much inflation, how can prices fall? Value has fallen. Value, has, inflation adjusted value of properties has fallen. But prices have not. Because everything's gone up by so much, but the property prices haven't. But that will catch up. It always catches up within five years of a double digit growth. So, that's why um, we're talking about setting yourself up in this window of opportunity. The next three, four years is this time that if you don't do anything or you don't expand um, and you don't do stuff, you'll regret it. With property, it's not about doing stuff all the time or um, going like clappers all the time. There are certain times in the property market cycle where the deals you do are more profitable than at other times. You know, you make more you, you set yourself up far better at times like this than you do buying deals in a boom years when everyone's talking about it. Um, so this is the time, this is the opportunity. Buy well, add value, create capital value and rental value, generate cash flow, hold on for that four, five-year period where we will see the next boom. We always know in the UK that you get these flatline periods, but booms follow. Um, and, and, and that's what it's about. It's about optimizing, um, optimizing this window of opportunity. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Yes? Does that make sense? Good. Um, so we're going to take a networking break. Now, what, what, I forgot to mention something, actually. Um, one thing Andrew and I are, are, are launching in February um, is a mastermind program. It's a mastermind program uh, focused on harnessing the opportunity of today. Um, so uh, w everyone that's attended Baker Street, you'll get an email um, with a little prospectus explaining what it's about. It's meant for not just new investors, but people who have, have dabbled a bit in property, done a bit of property, but wondering what to focus their efforts on now, right now, to harness this opportunity, this window of opportunity, and make the deals that you do really, really count. Um, so we're launching that in February. It's going to be restricted in numbers and, and that kind of stuff. And we'll send you um, a prospectus and an opportunity to book a call with us to discuss whether it's right for you and to answer your questions about that program. Um, but I'm, it, for, I'm amazingly excited about the next few years. Um, the, another stat I'd share with you is I had a lot of fun between 2009 and 2013. It was similar conditions to today. The chances to buy well, add value, and rent out, and you just waited a few years, and, um, and, and things happened. Um, and um, there was a report out from Savills that actually backed up what I was, I was, I'd always been thinking, which was, they said over the last 40 years, the best 10 years to have bought property and held it was actually from 2009 from 2009 to 2019. If you bought in 2009, 
um, and held it until uh, 2019. That was the best 10-year period in the last 40 years. Because if you bought well, added value, um, and, and held on with the rental cash flow, um, you saw a doubling or trebling of your asset, asset value. Because remember, you're buying cheap, you're adding value, and you're holding on for that boom. Um, that's why you get that double trebling effect. So it's not what you do, it's also when you do it. And that's why um, the time is over the next few years. The Baker Street Property Meet is the UK's largest and number one property investors networking event. The property market is going through monumental change right now. And at Baker Street Property Meet, we aim to keep you up to date with the latest tips and tricks and insider tactics to help you keep on top of your property investing game and succeed in these troubled economic times. The Baker Street Property Meet is fundamentally about networking because it's not what you know, it's who you know. And at Baker Street, we aim to connect you with the people to make your property journey a monumental success. There's no better place to be to further your property investment journey than the Baker Street Property Meet. So make sure you're here, you're connecting with myself and Andrew Roberts, our expert guest speakers and 300 passionate property people each and every month. See you at the next meet. Get your spot at bakerstreetpropertymeet.com.